Hello there, I'm Mount Payne 27 and this is Dean of Doom, the show where we give grades to classic and contemporary Doom wads. Why? Because ranking things is fun. Today's episode will be dedicated to Back to Saturn X Episode 2, Tower in the Fountain of Sparks, a megawatt released in 2014 and tinkered with on and off for the better part of eight years. It's the second part of a planned trilogy, which remains unfinished as of today. Man, I can't believe it's been almost two years since I covered the first BTSX. Time flies. Anyway, Tower in the Fountain of Sparks is the follow-up to the widely acclaimed vanilla-compatible magnum opus that kicked off Doom Mapping's greatest decade. BTSX2 added Josh Seeley, Zazer Acheron, Matt Tropiano, Eric the Green Herring Baker, and Adam Chorus Woodmancy to the lineup of designers, and rolls out an impressive new crop of textures which give life and personality to ancient cities and natural vistas alike. That's right, tech-based fatigue is yesterday's news. There's a brand new mixtape of Guided by Voices titles for those of you who haven't sold your souls to the Doom classic Unity port, and another incredible MIDI soundtrack to take in. So let's get this party started. Here's how the show works. Every map gets one grade for quality and one for difficulty. Quality grades go from A to F. Grade A levels are fun, memorable, visually distinctive, creative, and a fair challenge. We grade difficulty from X to E. X for extreme, E for easy, A through D in between. Keep in mind, my idea of a great map is probably not the same as yours, but that's okay. Disagreeing is part of the fun, after all. At the end of the day, this show is about spreading the joy of doom, so let's do so. Before we start, the rules are we play on ultraviolence and must pistol start each level, I need to play the wad twice before reviewing it, saves are allowed, and we go for 100% kills in all levels, making exceptions when it's just not worth it. I play on Z Doom, and today's compatibility level is vanilla. Now, to the wad. Map 1, Shadow Port. Having survived the sinking of the Fats Domino, you find yourself on unfamiliar shores with nothing but a Beretta and a shot of steroids to defend yourself. Excepting the chain gun, weapons are hard to come by in this demon-operated water treatment plant. Shadow Port is a beautifully balanced semi-Tyson experience, playing keep away with shotguns and gunners while withholding all other weapons except the secret plasma rifle. In no mood for the careful tiptoe Shadow Port demands, I got lost, impatient, and irritable my first time through this map, but subsequent runs yielded much better results. Ammo is tight but fair, the layout gives firm nudges in the right direction, and the ambiance, helped along by Stewboy's MIDI, is to die for. I especially love the pulsing lighthouse in the bay, and the good ship Vizplane Overflow, which contains a non-secret shipping container full of berserk packs. This cryptic marble square texture reveals an actual secret, hold that thought. With the red key acquired from the VPO, you can cruise to the exit, say hi and bye to the first archfile of the Megawad, and bail. Grade A. Difficulty C-. Map 2, Underwater Explosions. From the architect of Tough Skin River, we bring you Back to Barrels X. Saturn's a fun? Never mind. The BTSX team rarely relies on gimmickry to sustain their maps, but Tango floats underwater explosions on barrel-centric combat, giving you minimal firepower but enough unstable chemicals to take care of everything twice over. This archvile pinch can get ugly if the Martians don't absorb enough of the barrel blasts, but prompt super shotgun work will save the day. The final fight is all about lines of sight. Take out these two revenants without getting zapped or sniped, then pop the balloons behind the chain gunners and vials. For a map 2, underwater explosions offers good bang for your buck. Sorry. Grade B+, difficulty C+. Map 3, Wings of Thorn. A brisk offering from Alien Vendetta's Brad, Vorpal Spencer, and co-pilot Zazer Acheron, Wings of Thorn is one of only two maps with a double-digit kill count in BTSX2. This half-flooded stone keep wastes no space, resists right angles, and flows comfortably. The art style and architecture hint at a pre-industrial culture undiscovered by man. I want to call it gothic, but the label doesn't quite fit. Combat-wise, not much leaps out here. You get a free rocket launcher and an SSG with the yellow key, and you better save ammo for one of them if you want to survive the Skellington Stampede at the exit. Grade B, difficulty C. Map 4, Dirty Water. Welcome to BTSX2's first stumbling block. I'm only acquainted with Mike Yu's 3D Alfredson through his submissions to Community Chest 1 and 2, which are decidedly mean and hard to finish. To the newcomer, Dirty Water is similarly burdensome, a rambling, non-linear jaunt with an unclear itinerary. On replay, however, it's much more rewarding than Alfredson's other work. Acquiring the blue and yellow keys is the object of the game. To do that, you'll need to find pairs of blue and yellow switches that raise bridges to teleporters which route you to the key's hiding spots. The keys themselves raise a bridge to the lava corridor, which leads to the exit. Half an in-game hour is my personal best time on this map, so I'm not saying it's easy to get around, but I appreciate Dirty Water's set dressing and comfy atmosphere enough not to fret so much about over length. Most of the credit for the latter goes to Sarah Mancuso and her divine lullaby of a midi.
Dirty Water brings BTSX 2's first mini sode to a close, and while it might feel like heavy lifting now, it's probably the easiest quote unquote long map in the Megawad. Grade B. Plus. Difficulty B. Map 5, Tower in the Fountain of Sparks 1. BTSX Episode 2's hub maps don't have the same appeal as E1's magical metro stops. There was something meditative about them that E2 fails to replace. Zazer's natural landscapes are perfectly serviceable, and he keeps you from getting lost with health bonus crumb trails, but that's exactly the problem with E2's hubs. They only exist to convey you from one map to the next. The train stations felt organic and present, while the four towers in the Fountain of Sparks are just filler. My grade for this set of hub maps is a C, with no grade for difficulty. Map 6, Useless Inventions. A bit of a throwback to BTSX's first installment, the secret-rich Useless Inventions is the closest we'll get to a tech base in this megawad. Bjorn Ostman seems to be vying for some kind of Crate Maze Design Award. Not only does it take up half his floor plan, it also contains the literal key to beating his map. After clearing the street, raiding the building's catty corner to the warehouse, and procuring the yellow key, climb some boxes and jump down to where the chainsaw was. This yellow door leads to an early SSG, and after some platforming that demands substantial faith, you'll find a soul sphere and teleport to a switch that raises a lift to the dark building. Ride it up and you'll find the red keycard, but get this, it's worth jack all unless you also found this switch on the back of a crate. That switch reveals the red door, which provides back access to the final room and a rump-saving plasma rifle. Maybe it's just Jimmy Paddock's anxious midi, but the three-pronged offensive of meatballs, archies, and revenants makes me sweat a bit even today. I think Ostman justifies his super secrets with rewards proportional to the effort you spend looking for them this time, but I can understand why they might rankle some people. Grade B+, difficulty B. Map 7, Shrine to the Dynamic Years, Athens Time Change Riots. This is an actual song title. Eric the Green Herring Baker emphasizes rough and ready combat over visual intricacy. His map is quite linear and less ornate than back to Saturn's usual fare, but his fights are snappy and tough, and he's got a knack for giving monsters the positional advantage. This room with Kakos, Revenants, Mancubi, and later four pain elementals heavily favors snipers and flyers, but it's a jungle gem for Doomguy. From this Soul Sphere secret, you can get an early glimpse of the final arena, seemingly centered around the shrine itself. My first run at this fight burned itself into my memory. It's easily the hardest encounter in the Mega so far. Don't run out of rockets and you'll spare yourself a crispy fate. Make loops, use the shrine for cover, and don't give the shotgunners and cacos free hits. Grade B+, difficulty B+. Map 8, A Blue Shadow. Embracing the earthiest elements of Back to Saturn X2's texture pack and accompanied by a languid gym midi, A Blue Shadow is one of the prettiest maps in the Megawad and also the doziest. Mind you, that's not necessarily a bad thing if you're still recovering from Green Herring's flogging. Co-authors Tropiano and Fry only turn up the heat a few times, notably in this plasma gun pond and the end which throws an exit fake out and a pair of arch files at you. The unfolding blue building at the end is fun to dismantle and doesn't push the player too much. You might not retain many details from this map, but it sure is relaxing. Grade B, difficulty B minus. Map 9, Adverse Wind. The pleasant, petite Adverse Wind is unexpectedly one of my favorite maps in BTSX2. Maybe it's Stew Boy's MIDI, but I've always likened this place to an abandoned tech base turned pirate cove. The beginning reminds me of a Port Royal prison. It sparks a seaside feeling that I really like. It could well be that my imagination is just working overtime, but I don't hear anybody complaining. Half the enemies here are holding guns, so health might get dicey if you overlook the secret soul sphere lift. The spider mastermind is spring loaded with revenants, so save cells and put a cork in them. I get the sense that Team BTSX feels out of their comfort zone doing short maps like this. Just so you guys know, we appreciate it. Grade A-, difficulty B-. Map 10, Eureka Signs. In its second minisode ender, Back to Saturn X E2 starts to reveal its grand ambitions. The winding, multifaceted Eureka Signs is a true solo effort from Sarah Mancuso. She also composed its cinematic midi. Be warned, this is the first map in BTSX2 with the potential to bog you down. It's a long march through Eureka Signs, shadowy caverns and ruins, but its linearity makes it ironically easier to revisit than certain mammoths we'll see later. Essel Forsham's resource balancing is commendable. I found myself at death's door several times in this recording, but always found supplies waiting for me on the other side of fights. Sharp-eyed players can clip the wings of the map's hardest fight with this ingenious secret. Press the hidden switch in this devil face's flashing eyes, drop into the water, and ride the bookshelf up to a megasphere and 400 cells. It's a godsend for the quadruple archfile rush that comes next. Ride these sluggish lifts and time your jumps to return to the now open exit at the start of the map, survive another archfile mugging, and skedaddle. I think Eureka Sign's simmering atmosphere would have survived a paring down, but it's a solid, well-calibrated map with some excellent beats. Grade B+, difficulty B+. Map 11, Tower in the Fountain of Sparks 2 is BTSX2's second hub map. Map 12, 
Demons are real. Paul Skillsaw De Bruyne brings his signature buoyance back to back to Saturn X with Demons Are Real, a compact brawler that repeatedly surprises you with monster teleports, lowering walls, and oh sh arch files. The blue key fight is good fun with a full rocket launcher, and the ending is downright insidious. Both of these switches will summon monsters, but choose wisely, because the second one you hit also reveals an Archie, who will complicate your departure plans if you don't intervene ASAP. Everybody and their brother already knows I think Skillsaw is a genius, but I don't think his BTSX work deserves the same distinction. He can't compete with the other Back to Saturn Xers command of this texture pack, and his typical high-octane gameplay feels watered down here. Pun intended, of course. Grade B, difficulty B. Map 13, Nation Gone Dry. This strong outing from MIDI Meister James Paddock and Richard Tarnsman Fry adopts a desert temple aesthetic, whipping out some nifty arch textures that give the illusion of curvature without breaking the visplane bank. Your mission is to give the thirsty land a drink, which has the happy side effect of revealing the exit, a verdant oasis directly behind the starting teleporter. Paddock and Fry create a wonderful effect throughout the map where it feels like you're actually filling the place up with water. Observe. Between water diversion projects, you'll have plenty of snipers, vials, and skeletal heat stroke victims to deal with. If I were you, I'd hoard rockets and cells for the final fight. Take one step past this threshold, and Macubi, Arachnos, and the pair of archviles dancing on the wall tops will rush to their sanctuary's defense. Nation Gone Dry seems austere at first, but nowadays I find it refreshing. Grade A minus, difficulty B plus. Map 14, Shocker in Gloom Town. Let me tell you guys something. I used to think Shocker in Gloom Town was the worst map in this megawad. Maybe even the worst map across both episodes of Back to Saturn X. Between then and now, a tectonic shift took place. First, let's sketch out what we're looking at. Clocking in with 400 monsters and 8 secrets, Gloom Town is a long map, and even bigger than it looks at first, owing to Harrell and Ostman's economy of line deaths. In my first playthrough, I got foiled and frustrated frequently, but I've been playing the map without regard for its mysteries, and one lucky discovery changed the entire ballgame for me. See, Shocker in Gloomtown isn't a straight fight. The scales start off tipped well in the demon's favor, but you can outsmart them. Color cues will point you to the red key, and investigating a sound anomaly by this elevator will take you to the blue key. I can't overstate how much these discoveries can change your view of this map. With the red key, you can crush Mayor Mastermind, get an early plasma rifle, and take the back way into one of Gloomtown's hardest stages. The blue key crushes these pesky macubi and unlocks the BFG. Oh yeah. With these super-powered secrets and Jimmy's exhilarating midi at your back, Shocker and Gloomtown becomes a pleasure to dissect and plunder. I'm not exaggerating when I say that no map has risen so much in my esteem between playthroughs 1 and 2, and for me, that's the real Shocker and Gloomtown. Grade A, difficulty A-. Map 15, The Theory of Broken Circles. I'll preface this review with a caveat. I have played epic, non-linear maps that I've liked, but they are not my preferred genre, partly because of this show's 100% kills requirement, but more because they rarely quit while they're ahead. I attribute Shocker and Gloomtown's success to Mechadon, because Bjorn Ostman's solo effort is paunchier, blander, and more patience straining in every way. Theory of Broken Circles is a fairly hard start. Failing to pick up a rocket launcher will put meat back on the menu for this thronging horde of pinkies, revenants, manks, and airborne orbs. Running away just attracts more attention, and creates log jams which can screw you over later. The object of the game is to find three fiery portals which deliver you to the keys needed to exit, but there's always another way out of a map 15. Duck through this blood fall to discover a map which hints at how to open the secret exit. Track down three buttons lurking in covert corners of the canyon, step on all three, and return to the map. If you have at least two keys, you can surreptitiously vamoose. The scavenger hunt premise looks good on paper, but sweet Jesus does it drag in execution, especially if you're dredging this metropolis of look-alike blood caverns for secret areas and monster window dressing. After three glum experiences with a theory of broken circles, I doubt I'll ever give it another hour of my time. 
grade C, difficulty A minus. Map 31, Fire King says no cheating. Welcome to Back to Slaughter X. No doubt goaded on by his co-authors, Josh Seeley went completely bananas here, jam-packing Fire King with excess you'd never expect to see in a BTSX map. Hundreds of revenants and hell nobles, five spider demons, 15 cyber demons, and a ludicrous 73 arch files. I assume the Fire King's decree is in reference to the certainty of your game crashing if you try to save in vanilla. Fueled by Jimmy Paddock's supercharged rewrite of Great Hall from a certain itchy Speed of Doom map, Fire King almost rivals Resurgence at its most maniacal, only reined in by liberal disbursement of bulk cells and surplus power-ups. You've got two invulnerabilities to divide between the BFG Bonanza, the blistering yellow key triggered ambush, and the Archfile flood by the Golden Switch. The Lava Coliseum with the Sniping Mastermind and Archfile Watchmen is also brutal if you're running low on rockets and cells. After you use the blue and red keys to lower these big gates, Fire King starts to sputter. This Lava Pit fight feels redundant, this other Lava Pit fight also feels redundant, and it's nothing but cleanup, cheapo teleport ambushes, and unnecessary platforming from there to the finish line. The Fortress of Evil TM may look daunting, but you've already dealt with far worse. Nuke the Mancubi, circle strafe the Cybers, corral the Skeleton Parades, and polish off the last three big daddies and their little Archfile sisters to douse this map for good. I want to like Fire King, but it's way too long. Joshi and co made all their best points in the first 15 minutes. Needed some editing is becoming this WAD's tagline. Grade B+, difficult X minus. Map 16, Tower and the Fountain of Sparks 3 is back to Saturn X's third hub map. Map 17, Steeple of Knives. Fun fact, in the Unity port release, BTSX stands for Big Towers, says Zazer. The shortest non-hub map in the series to date, Steeple of Knives takes place in one of Zazer's signature skyscrapers. Each colorful switch summons a cocktail of foes that swirl into a cyberdemon-centric infight party. Watch out for arch files, budget your blur sphere, and this will be over in a tick. Steeple of Knives is a heated but taciturn taster for the third mini-sode and its brevity does not go unappreciated. Grade B+, plus, difficulty B. Map 18, Optional Bases Opposed. Paul De Bruyne's final BTSX contribution to date overstays its welcome and feels like it's going through the motions. I love his skill saw, but it's true. Outside of the opening scramble in this game of hide and seek in the pegboard arena, none of these fights make much impression. Monster window dressing pads out the already bloated kill count, and the red and yellow key paths are rote and uninspired, seemingly intended to precede the blue key segment, which holds a BFG locked behind red and yellow bars. I do like this hidden switch secret because the pair of flame boys trying to avenge their telefragged cousins amuses me. Optional bases opposed ranks low in Skillsaw's body of work. It's too big and streamlined, like somebody's uninspired impression of Skillsaw. Grade B minus, difficulty B plus. Map 19, Unbated Vicar of Scorched Earth. What matters is how well you walk through the fire. Tarnsman's first solo BTSX map radiates smugness. With its unorthodox weapon pickup order, rad suit starvation, huge tracts of secret ground, and super hidden Easter egg I didn't bother with because it's both a torch secret and a shootable switch, Unbated Vicar of Scorched Earth goes from peculiar to pretentious in a hurry. The mandatory progression is nothing special, rocket fueled, drenched in lava, and over monster window dressed, but depending on whether or not you've played Unbaited Vicar before, its final fight is either a chore or a barrel of fish to BFG. Remember in map 1 when I said hold that thought about this marble texture? Well, in this map it'll unlock your cell weapons, which are critical to beating Vicar without aspirin. Without the big effing gun, this tight space plus mastermind divided by archfile equals trouble. It's a hard-assed and haughty premise that really annoys me. Guess what, player? You get three minutes of rat suit time to clear the foes in the lava and find the obscure switch that purchases your freedom from the unpleasant ending I devised. Oh, and here's a computer map that doesn't even hint at the existence of the aforesaid critical secret area. Chump. Unbaited Vicar of Scorched Earth left me too disgusted to finish my first playthrough of this megawad, and replays have not changed my opinion of it. Grade D+, plus, difficulty A-. minus. Map 20, Speed Traps for the Bee Kingdom. Oh boy. So, Speed Traps for the Bee Kingdom is so f big that they had to hack Doom to get it to work. To summarize a professional's explanation, Bee Kingdom is within a single bite of the vanilla block map size limit, which essentially restricts the number of lines you can draw on a map. What's more, Tarnsman and Essel Forsham took advantage of an advanced node builder called Zocum BSP, which consolidated some data and gave them more wiggle room for detailing. I had to switch to DSDA Doom for just this map because ZDoom does not play nice with that node builder. Observe.
The Bee Kingdom experience is impressive, but profoundly exhausting. Frankly, I have no interest in writing a blow-by-blow -blow for this map because you'll never play it the same way twice, and more importantly, I don't ever want to play it again. In brief, Speed Traps of the Bee Kingdom was built for the plasma gun and rocket launcher. They're given to you at the very beginning, and you get a lot of ammo for them, but regrettably, the overscaled setting and abundance of sturdy foes make the combat drag ass. Bee Kingdom's dizzying non-linearity will give first, second, and third timers a headache, the red key being particularly tough to track down because of this missable jump. An unusual number of fights involve crushers, and they range from irrelevant to irritating. During the long stretches of time you spend not shooting anything, this theatrical midi starts to grate and adds self-seriousness to a map that already suffers from excess of it. All in all, Bee Kingdom is the most deflating map in the Megawad, a tedious blur of cave walls, ruins, and god Damn it! why do I have to go all the way around? It's right there! This map really makes me appreciate Shocker and Gloomtown, which was half as long and a quarter of the size. Grade D, difficulty A-. Map 21, Bulldog Skin. Thank God for Bulldog Skin. It's far from the best map in this set, but after more than an hour in the Bee Kingdom, its straightforwardness is a blessing. Is this supposed to be hell? The ruby caverns, stern stone outposts, lava flow, and viscera suggest it is, but I skipped the story text after map 20, so I'm in the dark. This is doom, man. Just go in there and kill. Bulldog Skin leans on a teleporting monster gimmick that I'm neither completely sold on nor inconvenienced by. Cheesing the cyber demons from this ledge feels too easy, but they're liable to blindside you in a straight fight, so cheese it is. With the yellow and blue keys, you can open the red key sanctum, lay some bones to rest, and watch a gotcha showdown that the spider will likely win since Saibi was in fighting earlier. Bulldog Skin hits what it aims for and its modesty is an asset. Grade B, difficulty B+. Map 22, Bite, in which Map Rot King Sibulus delivers another late coming slow burner to BTSX. This time around, it's Sarah Mancuso he owes a beer. Her quiet but determined midi teases trepidation out of the shadows and gives his dank dungeon a forbidden aura. Except for the ending and a handful of traps which can be prepared for, Bite is considerably milder than the rest of the mini so it wraps up, but I don't mind a deceleration near the finish line. Bite serves the same purpose as U.S. Mustard Company from BTSX1. It's a coda for a fearsome Act 3 and quietly hands the reins to Tarnsman, Mechadon, and Zazer, who will bring the Megawad home. Drink in the atmosphere, watch out for arch files, and mentally prepare yourself for one last push. Grade B, difficulty B. Map 23, Tower and the Fountain of Sparks 4 is BTSX2's final hub map. It's worth noting the significant scenery change here. A blood red moon dominates the sky, and Zazer incorporates some strange orange gore and purple lights into the mix. Wave to map 26. Map 24, Perhaps Now the Vultures. Perhaps Now the Vultures is my favorite pairing of map and title in the Megawad. The name is clever, sinister, and fitting for a playground of arch files circling the dead and soon to be. I've long since lost track of where we are story-wise, but perhaps now the Vultures looks like a tech base from Get Out of My Stations fell in a deep hole where Lovecraftian things reside. Crawling with vials and strewn with corpse muppets, this deadly sandbox map is all about cover and space management. You can jump to a plasma rifle hidden in the blood and save some rockets to handle the dinner rush of scavengers that shows up after you get the blue key. There's a BFG hereabouts which can be archfile jumped to, but I didn't feel like eating the damage and players more competent than myself won't struggle without it. With this tense and memorable outing, Tarnsman partially redeems himself for Vicar and Bee Kingdom. Grade A-, difficulty B+. Map 25, Unstable Journey. It's hard to say what makes Unstable Journey so much more playable than fellow Magnum Opus's theory of broken circles and speed traps of the Bee Kingdom, but I've cobbled together some contributing factors. Number one, Mechadon's map has a higher population density, and his fights are padded out with weaker mobs. Shredding them makes your big guns feel useful and runs up the kill count faster, translating to a feeling of making progress that offsets the inevitable dead time. Number two, Unstable Journey's landmark moments are more impactful. At very least, nobody's gonna forget the frantic red key ambush with a BFG brouhaha that erupts in the dark library. Number three, Mechadon is a lighting wizard, capable of turning pedestrian rooms and bland caverns into pockets of mystery. Speaking of which, number four, you really have to play this map to fully understand the brilliance of Jimmy Paddock's MIDI. It's a subdued, absorbing track that infuses Mechadon's world with intrigue and suspense, surviving virtually endless repeats. It's a faithful companion on an unstable journey.
Time passes more quickly in this map than in Back to Saturn X's other supergiants. Maybe I'm just sweet on Mechadon, but he's one of the best in the biz at Mega Maps by general consensus, and by my reckoning, this is one of his most atmospheric and approachable works. Grade A-, difficulty B+. Map 26, Beneath a Festering Moon. In a word, Overrated. Beneath a festering moon might as well be called Zazer Acheron in a nutshell. It's got spiraling architecture with viz planes at capacity, environmental shape shifting, and weirdness seeping out of its pores. The Back to Saturn X team seems to have given Zazer carte blanche. He completely dispenses with Episode 2's visual motifs and goes off road in the gameplay department. The map alternates between uncomfortable crampage and excessive space. Your perambulations through hit scanner filled caves and run ins with revenants and pain elementals in the purple goo towers strongly suggest patient play. If you go slowly and don't miss the this giant secret ammo cache behind the goo fall, you'll have nothing to worry about. I tend to dislike when mappers seclude significant areas and secrets, but this freaky arena is one of Festering Moon's highlights. Well, except for the Revenant monster window dressing. What stuck with me most about Festering Moon is its ending, which is either stupid hard or completely anticlimactic depending on whether or not you approach the warp gate right away. There's a BFG stashed in the tail end of this base, and you can press this button to open an invulnerability which also teleports you right into the thick of it. Tough skin river, this is not. Beneath the Festering Moon is more epilogue than closer. It's a quiet, quirky, and inspired piece of world building, but unfit as a final challenge. Grade B, difficulty B. Map 27? So, where did that big portal take us? Well, beats me. Tarnsman's skeletal to be continued can't match Essel Forsham's cathartic shipwreck, but hey, it's hard to catch lightning in a bottle. Since Untitled amounts to a credits map, I'll leave off grading it. So, I've concluded that Back to Saturn X Episode 2 benefits from replay. That's singular. Familiarity lifted several of these maps significantly on Second Encounter. The playthrough 3 of this WAD was an ordeal, especially in the second half. Like its precursor, BTSX2 starts strong, establishes a vivid aesthetic, and then lapses into indulgence and repetitiveness. But unlike BTSX1, its ending does not come to the rescue. There's no equivalent to the 20-minute tech base formula in Tower in the Fountain of Sparks, but I also don't recall any maps in Get Out of My Stations taking an hour to complete. Very few of these maps repay the time invested in them, milking the wow factor on first go around and subsequently stagnating. The real hero of this set is the soundtrack, which would give any megawatt a triple-A sheen unassisted. Alien Jungle, Lost City, Noir, Enigma, Geometry, and Weather Warning are some of the finest Doom midis ever written. I have a feeling this will be considered the worst installment in the Back to Saturn X trilogy if and when instructions to the rusty time machine comes out, though certain team members will have to reduce the size of their egos. I, I mean, maps. We'll see. My final grade for Back to Saturn X 2, Tower in the Fountain of Sparks, is a B. Difficulty-wise, it starts off harder than BTSX1, but coasts to the finish line, rounding out to a solid B. Approachable, but not a pushover. Now for my Dean's list. Valedictorian, Map 14, Shocker in Gloomtown. Salutatorian, Map 1, Shadowport. Class President, Map 31, Fire King Says No Cheating. And the dunce cap goes to Map 20, Speed Traps for the Bee Kingdom. Thank you very much for watching. Please feel free to share your thoughts on the wad down below. I'd love to hear what you think, and I'll heart your comments to let you know I've read them. Now I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my generous patrons. Aaron Allen, Agile Jackson, Agu XYZ, Alec Wehrman, Alephany, Alex Max, Alex Topfer, Artisan Talzar, Bo Higginbotham, Beatbeard, Ben Barrett, Birdburn, Blind as a Mat, Builder Sith, Bitefire, Kappa Bitch, Kali Bluefin, Cheese Wheel, Chris Duthat, Chris O'Neill, Christopher Hart, Christophine Place, Cutman Mike, Dan, Dario Romero, Dave Davidson, Delirium, Do To Yourself, Dorothy Miller, Eggboy, Ember, Emma Essex, Endless Moose, Faithful, Felix Wilson, Francis T218, General Roasterock, Glenn Marmon, Goody, Griffin Upchurch, Hyakcho, In Captivity, Jeff Hibbert, Jeff Sherilla, Jose Ballestero, Josh Ballard, Jude, Just Some Schmuck, Just Great 98, Camille Bernadotte, Killplane, Leon Staten, Logan Lazalda, Lumnal, Mark Rowland, Master Drew 117, Matt, Matthew Gower, Matty Light 1990, Michael Akins, Miracle Water, Mixer, MK 2021, Moco Mothman MM47, Mosicon, Myolden, Nafferty, Neurometry, Knights 108, Number 26, NX Avery, Omnibot, Orion Burke Pool, Painful Hill 72, Pezaveng Zhaj, Philip Coffey, Pixel Perfect PT, Pyro Shi, Quibs, Randy A, Red Doomed Earth, Reese, Reese Anderson, Rune, 
Sean Doherty, Sega Monkey, Sid Menon, Small Venom, Snacker Fork, Space Clanka, Spinner 8, Stone Mason, Stupid Nick, Sunriser, Sylvester Priss, Tara Kushino, That Guy Known as Will, The Cloptologist, The Fiery Charmeleon, The Dinosaur Heretic, TJG1289, Trilby Trillion, Turbine 2K5, Ultra Cow, Why Bemo Not a Crab, and William Huber. Thank you. I appreciate you all so much. This is Mount Payne 27, and I'll see you in the next episode of Dean of Doom.